Greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to have you here with us as we continue on our journey with Jesus through the book of Exodus. Today we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 21. And so I'll invite you to grab your Bibles, and then we will take a look at God's Word together. Again, it's Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 21. Now, much has happened since the Passover back in Exodus chapter 12 and the crossing of the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14. They've seen God's destruction of the Egyptians as they were drowned in the Red Sea. Though they had been thirsty, God provided them sweet waters. Though they were hungry, God provided them manna from heaven and meat to eat in the evening. They had conquered the Amalekites, thanks to the Lord, and now they had reached Mount Sinai. Remember that God had promised that the fulfillment of his promise would come when Moses would lead the people, lead the Israelites to Mount Sinai, where he had seen that burning bush and God had spoken to him there on the mountain of God that they would return and they would worship the Lord. This was the fulfillment of that promise. Now all the people of Israel had gathered by the mountain. Moses had gone up into the mountain, and upon his return, the people were to consecrate themselves by washing their garments. No one was to touch the mountain lest they die. When the trumpet sounded, they were to make their way to the edge of the mountain. And so just to give a little build up into our text today, I'm going to read the closing verses of Exodus 19, starting with verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord, to look, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Now, this text here sets the stage then for our reading for today. When God provides his people, Israel, the Ten Commandments. We're going to start with just reading the first couple of verses here of chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God once again identifies himself as the same God uh, as those he identi- when he identified himself to Moses. Uh, he's identified himself to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. He identifies himself so that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is in fact the one and only God, the same God. There was to be no confusion then about who was addressing them. He had kept his promise by delivering them from the bondage of slavery. What's more, he continued to speak to them in words. The commandments of God were first delivered through the medium of speech from God. We hear in the Gospels on numerous occasions, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This was for Moses to hear, for the people of God, the Israelites, to hear, to learn by heart. It was not until several chapters later, though, that the book of Exodus, in the book of Exodus, that the commandments were actually written on those stone tablets that we are so accustomed to. So God gives them his commandments, 
This is not a stair-stepping method, though, to reach God or somehow earn his approval. This is a gift given by God to his beloved people so that they would know then how to faithfully follow him. As their savior from bondage, their God-given response was then to be obedience to him because he was their God and they were his people. Note the intimate relationship here that he was calling them into. He was once again affirming that lasting covenant with his children, with his people. We also ought to know that the commandments are a gift. I use that word intentionally there. They are not some rules posted by God because he wanted to be bossy or anything like that. They're given so that we might examine ourselves according to them, see our sins for what they are as those that actually our sins produce death. They're certain, certain killers and recognize then our desperate need for a savior from sin, from death and from the devil. Notice again then how all of this points the people of God to the promised Messiah who was to come. The promised seed of Abraham who would save his people from their sins. These commandments that are to be given by God function in three ways. The three uses of the law are a curb, a mirror, and a guide. The first use of the law is a curb. A curb on a street redirects a vehicle back onto the street so harm does not befall the vehicle or its passengers. So it is with the law. It redirects us that we should go in the way that we should go in following the will and the way of the Lord. The second use of the law is a mirror. We know how a mirror functions. It shows us our reflection. So we rightly see our sin as sin and we rightly see ourselves as sinners as those who are disobedient in thought, word, and deed against God, and we are naturally enemies of God. It's important that we see that sin for what it truly is, so that we see that need for a Savior. The third use of the law is a guide. Think of a GPS device or a global positioning system there, or a map application that you might have on your smartphone. The goal is to show you the way to go. So it is with the third use of the law. God shows us the way to go to follow the Lord. Now, as we move into the next verses, we're also going to include then the meanings in Luther's small catechism as we examine these commandments one at a time. This is always helpful for us as review in reviewing because we are always catechumens. We are always learners of the faith from the point of our baptism all the way until the point that the Lord calls us home. And so I'm going to read a large section here, verses 3 to 17. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. To fear God is to have the utmost respect and awe of God as the one who can grant life and can also take it away. He is the creator God. There's this holy reverence that recognizes that we then are creatures. And he is the creator, the redeemer, and the sanctifier, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is our sole source of well-being and livelihood, both temporal and eternal. 
To love God is to be devoted to him above all else. Where love is so watered down these days, and that word is used so loosely, this commandment calls upon us to cherish God as our Savior. To trust God is to rely upon him for everything and recognize that he will be faithful to all of his promises. We can, in fact, lean upon him. A God is anything that we place our fear, love, and trust in, and that, unfortunately, can be money, power, self. But none of these things are God, nor are we. There is only one true God. The second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse Swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. Here in this commandment, we behold the holiness of God, and we see that his name is set apart in how we use it, and we address him as Lord. To use his name in vain, or to use it loosely, or in the form of cursing, is to treat not just his name disrespectfully, but God himself. We are also to steer clear of anything that is demonic or of the devil and would only lead us away from the Lord. Proper use, then, of the Lord's name is in prayer, where we turn to the Lord for all of our needs and trust that he will provide according to his will, and we give him the praise that he is due. The third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. God is very clear on the fact that he is setting apart the Sabbath day as holy. The Sabbath in the Old Testament was on Saturdays. Once Jesus rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, it shifted to Sunday, as every Sunday is a little Easter, as Martin Luther put it. This calls upon us to be active in our worship life and not filling our schedules with extracurricular activities that only get in the way of our gladly hearing and learning God's word. This now rounds out the first table of the law. Commandments 1 through 3 make up that first table and are summarized in these words. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, mind, and strength. This table of the law highlights then that vertical relationship that we have between us and God. And so now we turn our attention to the second table of the law, commandments 4 through 10. This table is summarized in the words of the Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is that horizontal relationship that we have with others as everyone is our neighbor. The fourth commandment is honor your father and your mother. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Those in authority are gifts given to us by God. This directs our attitudes and our deeds to show respect of that authority and see them as instruments of God's way of caring for his people to provide order in our world. Should a leader act outside of the ways of God? Well, Acts 5.29 directs us to obey God rather than men. The fifth commandment, you shall not murder. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. This commandment obviously speaks of the crime of murder that we are not to murder, but it also goes beyond that in our attitudes toward our neighbors, to bear hatred, or to bear a grudge in our hearts is the same thing to have murder in our heart toward that person. It is the same thing then to commit as is to commit the crime of murder in the eyes of the Lord. We also are to keep an eye out for others, looking to their needs and seeing then how we might address them and give them care with the resources that we have been blessed with by God. Sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other. Here we see the beauty of how God blesses both man and woman to be husband and wife, that they would love and honor each other, but also to see that all of us, our bodies, are given to us as a gift from the Lord, to serve as temples unto the Lord, that are to be retreated with respect and honor. And this impacts then how we dress, our modesty before others. Out of love for others, we dress with modesty so that we may not draw them into temptation. 
and speaks to how we behave and how we speak to others, that we do not do so crassly and crudely, but also recognizing that our the way we speak is a direct reflection upon our attitude toward our own body as well as that of others. This teaches us then to steer clear of pornography and indecent sexual behavior or cohabitation or sex outside of wedlock or infidelity or homosexuality or anything that would be out of the realm of what God has deemed as good. In the case of marriage, that would be when one man and one woman are united as husband and wife. This is how God defines marriage. God desires marriage and the procreation of children within that marital union as it is what is best for the family. The seventh commandment, you shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. In a world of scams and fraud and identity theft, this calls upon us to respect the possessions of others, recognizing that what is theirs is theirs. Theft comes out of a heart of discontent and a lack of gratitude or of the of the provision of the Lord. It is also coming out of a heart of greed, where one can't ever seem to have enough. This also connects us then to the ninth and the tenth commandments, with, with which are in regard to coveting. So we are to help protect the possessions of others rather than take what is not ours. The Eighth Commandment. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. This commandment directs us to put the best construction on everything, recognizing that the importance there is great importance in upholding and protecting the reputations of others. Lies and gossip only detract from obeying these words of the Lord. So we stand up for those who are being slandered as a way of showing that we love and care for them as well as what others may think of them. The ninth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. The tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not entice or force away our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals, or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do their duty. The ninth and the tenth commandments go together. They go to the topic of coveting. It goes back to that attitude of discontentment. When all that I focus on is what I don't have, my heart will be filled with jealousy and coveting, a sinful desire for what is not mine. God calls us instead to have a spirit of gratitude and appreciation without all of the comparisons toward others and what they may have. In all of these commandments, remember, it is a gift, a gift given by God, and it is done all in the name of, the, of love, of love for you. You see, the summary of all Ten Commandments is one word, love. It's a gift given in love to you and a gift given in love to the Israelites as well there on the mountain of God. Now, how does this impact the way that we worship? Recognizing the fact that as they went to the mountain of God, that they were doing so in order to worship. As we enter into the house of the Lord and the service begins with the invocation to remember our baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we then confess our sins. But it is important for us to learn by heart those Ten Commandments and their meanings so that when that time of confession comes, when that moment of silence comes for us to examine ourselves in light of the Ten Commandments, we then are then rightly able to ask ourselves, how have I sinned against these commandments? Where have I been in error? What do I need to say that I'm sorry for? What do I need to express that contrition, that sorrow over the sin for? And then lay it before the feet of Christ and his cross and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that as we confess our sins, he is always faithful to forgive us. But it's important, absolutely vital, that we know these Ten Commandments as the law has been written upon our hearts in order that we might be able to see the difference between right and wrong, but also that when we are wrong, that we turn from our sinful ways, that we repent of our sins, and we go and sin no more after having been forgiven. 
This is the beauty. This is the gift of the Ten Commandments given to us by God. If you consider the alternative and you don't know the Ten Commandments, then you would do whatever you would want and you would continue to go away from the Lord. And that would only lead towards death. God has given us his commandments to so show us our sin so that we see clearly, ever so clearly, our need for a Savior who forgives sins. After all, that's what Jesus does. Verses 18 to 21, then, for today. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood, up, stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. One would have to agree that to have the Almighty God speaking in such thunderous fashion upon the mountain would have anyone shaking in their boots, or in this case, shaking in their sandals. But that's the point. The commandments ought to put a holy and awesome fear of God within us. Being in the presence of God ought to put a holy and awesome fear within us. We are sinners being welcomed into the presence of the Almighty God. This is an awesome privilege, but we're sinners. And so we need to repent. As we behold God as he reveals himself to us and see that he is our Savior, out of fear, love, and trust, we should desire then to gladly obey him, for he is our God and we are his people. The great news is, is that all fear is removed. All fear of condemnation is removed because the one who stands in our stead, it is Jesus Christ. Now just think for a moment of these people standing there on this mountain, or by this mountain rather, and being there in the presence of God. And allowing them that moment then to think of all that God had done for them. That he had promised that he would send a deliverer to, in order to rescue them. That he would rescue them and deliver them from their bondage. And that is exactly what he had done. Now think of all that God has done in your life. Think of all of the blessings that he has bestowed upon you. And now, maybe take a moment and give thanks to God for all of that. As we think about them standing there near that mountain, it brings to mind this. We seem to have lost much of that holy fear these days. We would much rather bring God down to our level where he is approachable and make Jesus simply our friend or our buddy rather than recognize him from the perspective of our human frailty. Our natural desire is for us to be gods of our own world. And that doesn't lead us to be humble before the Almighty God. To know that Jesus is the Almighty God in the flesh given for us. Unfortunately, we would rather approach God in arrogance and entitlement and think that we know better than what his word actually directs us to do. Nothing could be further from the truth, though. God demands a holy fear of him for our benefit, as he says in his first commandment, that we should have no other gods. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. It is good for us as creatures to constantly heed that, because the temptation is always there to think that we are the gods of our own world. Remember, all of what God shared with his people at Sinai, he also shares with us. And why? It's all done in the name of love. God loves us. He does not want us to separate ourselves from, uh, from him or separate ourselves from others. And so he shows us, he reveals to us his commandments so that we then see that we are sinners and we do need Jesus. And because of the fact that we are sinful, we do disobey. But he sent his son to be our savior, the one who perfectly obeyed God's commandments, the one who lived that perfect life. 
And then he served as that perfect once for all sacrifice in our stead. The death that we should have died, he died for us. Thanks be to God for his gracious gift of his commandments and for the provision of his son sent to save us. Let's pray. Today we're going to pray a prayer for humility. Let us pray. O God, you resist the proud and give grace to the humble. Grant us true humility after the likeness of your only Son, that we may never be arrogant and prideful and thus provoke your wrath, but in all lowliness be made partakers of the gifts of your grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and always. Amen. God's peace to you.